In this tutorial we're going to look at the halogens. The first aim is to compare the properties of the halogens, then describe the halide reactions, and finally explain the order of reactivity and apply this to displacement reactions. The word halogen means salt, as in the word halide, salt, generator. So literally the halogens are salt makers. When they combine to other elements they can make salts. You saw how sodium and chlorine reacted to make the salt sodium chloride, commonly known as table salt, which we put on our food. But the halogens by themselves are extremely reactive and dangerous chemicals, some of them even toxic. One of the most notorious uses of a halogen was where chlorine gas was used in World War I during trench warfare. Chlorine gas is very toxic and will cause asphyxiation, cause people to suffocate. But halogens also have many beneficial uses, like for example putting fluorine into toothpaste to kill bacteria, or bromine into lights to make long-lasting halogen lights. But before we can understand their use, we must understand their properties. The halogens are the group 7 elements. You can see them under group 7 in your periodic table. They are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. You will not really need to discuss astatine. In a school lab, you'll probably see chlorine, bromine, and iodine, but fluorine, because it's so highly reactive and dangerous, you would not find. So let's compare their properties. Firstly, fluorine is a colourless gas. It is the most reactive halogen. Chlorine is a pale yellow-green gas. It's very toxic. It's also highly reactive, but not as reactive as fluorine. Bromine, other than mercury, is the only other liquid at room temperature and under normal atmospheric pressure on the periodic table. It is an orange liquid. Like chlorine, it is also toxic and it's also very volatile. What this means is it will readily change state. So when you pour bromine out as a liquid, you'll see it very quickly evaporates and forms these red vapours as a gas. Iodine is a dark grey solid. It's crystalline, in other words, it has a regular arrangement of atoms, and it sublimes. It can undergo sublimation. Sublimation occurs when a solid turns into a gas without turning into a liquid first. So when you take ice out of a freezer, you'll notice that you get a kind of gas coming off it. So ice sublimes. More interestingly, when it does sublime, it forms purple vapours and not grey ones. So notice how the colour changes as you go down the group and the state changes, going from gas, gas, to liquid, to solid. Colourless, pale green, orangey brown, grey, but sublimes, producing purple vapours. All the halogens have seven electrons on their outer shell, that is why they're in group seven, and that also explains why they're highly reactive. They only need one more electron to complete their outer shell. All halogens form diatomic molecules. Because they're so reactive, two halogen atoms will covalently bond to gain stability. So you'll never find fluorine as a single atom, or chlorine as a single atom, or bromine or iodine as a single atom naturally you will always find halogen atoms paired up to make diatomic molecules. So you'd always write F2 in a chemical equation, or Cl2 or Br2 or I2. You can get an idea of what that looks like here. So not a single atom, but bonded to another one. Di, meaning two, atomic, two atoms, two atoms bonded together to make a molecule. Learn these facts well because they do come up in exams as simple one mark, two mark questions. So that is how you compare the properties of the halogens. So now we're going to look at the halide reactions, the salt making reactions. So halogens react with most metals like iron, sodium and aluminium to make metal halides, metal salts. The first reaction we're going to look at is sodium and chlorine, the halogen chlorine to make sodium chloride. If you remember, sodium's in group 1, so it has one electron in its outer shell. Chlorine is in group 7, so it has seven electrons in the outer shell, so they react very well together. Sodium only needs to transfer its outer electron to chlorine, and they both become stable. They gain an opposite charge and attract each other. So you can see that electron on the outer shell being transferred to chlorine here. So let's watch that in action. even reacting and that there is sodium chloride so you had this poisonous gas this very reactive metal but when they bond they gain stability and become much safer in fact we can consume that we put it on our food so what we've done is we've made the metal halide sodium chloride now if you remember you have to balance this carefully because remember chlorine is a diatomic molecule so it's always written as Cl2 so you can see on both sides of the equation sodium's already balanced but chlorine we have one more on this side than this side 
but by placing a 2 here, we now have two molecules of sodium chloride, so that balances, because 2 chlorine, 2 chlorine, and 2 atoms of sodium here, and 2 here, so that balances 2. If you've forgotten how to balance equations, watch the tutorial on balancing chemical equations. So now we're going to look at the reaction between aluminium and bromine to make aluminium bromide. You can see it's a very dark brown liquid forming vapours, you can see coming off. Just a bit of aluminium here, no extra heat needed, but you'll notice the reaction is a lot longer for this one, so that suggests that bromine is less reactive than chlorine. It takes a while. It's a lovely reaction. So you can see crystals of salt here. It's not very clear from the video, but they are crystals of aluminium bromide. So what's going on here? Well, firstly, aluminium is in group three, so it has three electrons in its outer shell. But bromine's in group seven, so it has seven electrons. Every bromine needs one more electron. So the only way aluminium can bond with bromine is if it has three bromine atoms for it to give its three electrons too, like so. Because aluminium's lost three electrons, it gains a three plus charge. And because each bromine gains an electron, it gains a one minus charge. So you can see three one minus charges and one three plus charge. So they basically bond together because opposite charges attract. So the balance symbol equation is a bit more complicated here. Do remember that we give bromine a liquid state symbol. It's the only liquid in the periodic table other than mercury, as I said before. The reason why this is awkward is you have three Br here, you see aluminium bromide has three bromine, you can see why here, but bromine is a diatomic molecule, so how do you make two and three balance? Well they both go into six, so what do you have to multiply them by to make it six? So we can put a two here, and that means we now have six bromine, and we can put a three here, and that means we have six bromine on this side, three times two, two times three. But by putting a 2 here, we also double up on the aluminium, so we must balance that on this side. Finally, let's look at my personal favourite, aluminium with iodine to make aluminium iodide. You'll notice this reaction lasts a lot longer, and therefore it is less reactive than bromine, and less reactive than chlorine, and certainly less reactive than fluorine. Have a watch. So it's a dark grey solid, and some aluminium on top of heating. You can see sublimation here, purple vapours coming off. Really lovely colour. This reaction goes on for ages. You do need a fuming cupboard to take away the harmful vapours. Once again, you can see a bit of salt deposit there. That's aluminium iodide. So just like before, aluminium is in group 3, has 3 electrons to give. Iodine's in group 7, has 7 electrons in its outer shell. Each iodine needs one more electron. So that's what happens. Aluminium gives its outer electrons to iodine. And just like before, aluminium picks up a 3 plus charge and iodine gains a 1 minus charge. There are 3 iodines with their 1 minus charges to balance out the 3 plus charge on aluminium. So just like before, we have the same dilemma. Notice how this time the state symbol for iodine is solid. So we had chlorine as a gas, bromine as a liquid, and iodine as a solid. But you balance just like you did before, because you have three iodines here, two here, they both go into six, so you have to make them six. So you can put a two there, a three there, and a two there to balance out the aluminiums. But halogens don't just react with metals, they can also react with hydrogen to make hydrogen halides. Hydrogen halides are water soluble, and when you dissolve them in water, they form acids. For example, if you react hydrogen and chlorine, you make hydrogen chloride. So hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell, just needs to lose it to gain stability and become positively charged. And chlorine has seven electrons, so it just needs one more electron. So it just transfers it over. As a result, they gain an opposite charge and attract each other. So that's the word equation. Please be aware, if you're asked to write a word equation, do not write the chemical symbols. You will not get any marks, even though it's more difficult. You must do the word equation. Well, is this balanced? We do have two chlorines on this side, two hydrogens on this side, but one hydrogen and one chlorine on this side. So we can fix that quite easily by putting a two there. That balances it. So that is how you describe the halide reactions. So now let's understand the reactivity pattern within group 7. Fluorine is the most reactive, and astatine at the bottom is the least reactive, but you won't really deal with astatine, so let's just say iodine is the least reactive. Now this is the opposite to the alkali metals, where the top one was least reactive, that was lithium, and francium was the most reactive, so it's reversed in group 7. Why is that? Well, there's a very logical reason. Remember, all halogens have 7 electrons on their outer shell, that's why they're in group 7. 
they all need one more electron from a nearby atom to complete their outer shell. So unlike the alkali metals which need to lose that electron, halogens need to attract electrons. So the fewer shells there are, the closer the distance between the positively charged nucleus and nearby electrons. So there's a stronger force of attraction, so it's easier for fluorine to attract nearby electrons. As you go down the group, there are more shells, so there's a greater distance between that positively charged nucleus and surrounding electrons. So it's a bit harder because there's a weaker force of attraction to pull in nearby electrons. And once again, we play this logic forward. More shells as you go down, so as the atomic number increases, you get more shells, and therefore the distance between the nucleus and nearby electrons is greater, the force of attraction is weaker, so it's harder to draw in nearby electrons. So halogens become more reactive up the group because there are less shells. Therefore, there's less distance between the positively charged nucleus and nearby electrons. So there's a stronger force of attraction to attract nearby electrons. So understanding patterns of reactivity in group 7 is essential for understanding displacement reactions. Displacement reactions occur when one more reactive element displaces a less reactive element from its compound, basically replaces it, switches. So let's look at uh, potassium chloride here. You see, when we put it in water, the ions separate out, making it possible for them to react. Now we're gonna add some iodine into the mix, iodine ions. Now if you look, iodine is way below chlorine in this group, so iodine is less reactive than chlorine. Therefore, iodine will not be able to replace or displace chlorine from its compound. So if you look at the equation here, iodine plus potassium chloride still gives you iodine and potassium chloride, but they're dissolved in solution. The point is there's no reaction because we've tried to get a less reactive element displacing a more reactive element. Doesn't happen. Now let's try another reaction. So we have potassium bromide this time and we're reacting it with chloride ions. So we put our potassium bromide into water, the ions separate out, and now we bubble in chloride ions. So ask yourself, which is the more reactive element, chlorine or bromine? Well, chlorine is higher up in this group, so chlorine is more reactive, so can displace bromine from its compound, and that's what happens. So chlorine reacts with potassium, liberating bromine. Because bromine is now liberated, it now takes on its usual properties, and you turn that water into an orangey liquid. That indicates that bromine has been liberated, been freed up. If they ask you to explain what you see, then you say the water turns orange because chlorine is more reactive than bromine, so we'll displace it from its compound. So displacement reactions are really easy if you just remember the order of reactivity. More reactive will displace less reactive. Less reactive cannot displace more reactive. So here's the simple equation for that. Chlorine plus 2KBr will give you bromine, so that's liberated to make 2KCl. I haven't done all the numbers exactly here. I just gave you this so you understand the concept. And that explains the order of reactivity, and you can now apply it to displacement reactions.